So what is a sigil, you might ask? And, uh, and a sigil is, is uh, generally just sort of any kind of symbol used in magic. Uh, it comes from the Latin word sigillum, which means seal or signet. Um, and a lot of sigils, especially Renaissance ones, they kind of look like line drawings. Um, they tend to be kind of simpler than, you know, the magical images that you'll get out of the Picatrix, where it's like, you know, an image of a, you know, a woman holding a comb and an apple or an image of a man in armor or something like that. Sigils are kind of like line drawings, typically. Uh, frequently, especially in the Renaissance, and maybe maybe all of the sigils in the Renaissance tend to be symbols for different spirits, gods, demons, angels, or things of that nature. Um, although in modern magic, you do see sigils that are used for magical orders, uh, sigils like uh, Ospen Osman Spares, uh, chaos magic sigils, and things like that. Um, and I usually, I, I think sigils sort of count as a subset of magical images, uh, which you've probably heard me talk about before. Um, and so a lot of the techniques that you can use with magical images, you can also use with sigils. Okay, so in the Renaissance, <clears throat> sigils basically, uh, you, you'll find like almost every Renaissance grimoire uh, is filled with sigils. Sometimes they're really fancy and good looking. Sometimes they're really crappy, squiggly lines. Um, but almost always they are either tied to uh, specific operations or specific spirits. So for instance, these two sigils on the screen right now are from the Key of Solomon. And uh, they're from the Mathers uh, Key of Solomon. And they're both uh, tied to Mercury and they each get used for a specific purpose uh, that's uh, connected to Mercury. Um, here are all the sigils of the uh, Ars Goetia, uh, which also I think, this, these are also I think from the Mathers version of that, and um, these are all tied to, you know, various uh, spirits which we usually call Goetic demons that do various earthly tasks and things like that. Um, and then I think another really famous set are the sigils from the Heptameron, which was a grimoire included in the fourth book of occult philosophy. Um, and, uh, and basically with any of these sort of grimoire sigils, the, the book that they came from typically has uh, instructions on how to use them. But uh, modern practitioners have adapted them in a lot of interesting ways. So for instance, uh, the sigils from the Key of Solomon get used in a lot of uh, American folk magic, um, typically, you know, printed out on paper or traced out on paper with, you know, petitions or whatever written on the back, uh, and then consecrated with holy oils and candles and incense and stuff like that. Uh, I know people are doing a lot of really interesting things with goetic sigils, but I don't have a ton of experience with that. Um, I do know that I've got friends who have used goetic spirits and goetic sigils to do things like help hunt for housing and I'm sure you can probably still use some of them for treasure hunting. Hint, hint. <laughs> um, so yeah, so so a lot of those, you can find uh, directions for using them from uh, in, in the grimoires that they are printed in, but also you can um, adapt them with with modern practice. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in in them in a little later. <clears throat> so like I was saying, uh, Renaissance magical sigils are usually based around the name of a spirit. Uh, I guess the Key of Solomon sigils are a little different since most of them have kind of like an intent, but they're still tied to sort of like a planetary archangel. Um, but mostly intent-based sigils are modern, and I think that they're probably from the early 20th century. I suspect that uh, Austin Osmond Sparrow was the first one who really uh, popularized that. But a lot of the techniques um, can uh, be used, a lot of the same techniques can be used for both of them. Um, and we'll see later on that, uh, that Sparrow's method for, draw for making chaos magic sigils, uh, while it was certainly innovative, it possibly didn't just come out of nowhere. He might have been inspired by some earlier techniques. Um, but uh, one of the things that I, that I think is worth exploring is taking some of these Renaissance techniques that we're going to talk about and use them uh, in the way that like Spare would have used chaos magic uh, uh, sigils, right? So encoding 
um, intent and ne not necessarily spirit names. Especially since a lot of the old sigil making techniques are more complicated and have math, and so they're more fun. 